Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to part two of Deep Learning for Computer Architects. So again, this is based on the book of the same name that comes from the Synthesis Lectures on Computer Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about the foundations of deep learning. So this will be, um, you know, basically covering chapter two or the first half of chapter two. So what we're going to be going over is the basic structure of a neural network, um, as well as a little bit of the math behind neural networks. So first of all, let's talk about the difference between these two different types. So we have biological and artificial neural networks. Now the biological neural networks, um, they more faithfully try to um, replicate you know, biological neurons. And examples of this um, are things like neuromorphic computing. So they're actually trying to mimic a biological neuron. While we have artificial neural networks, which are you know, extremely common today, um, which instead of trying to faithfully represent a biological neuron, they're more inspired by that style of computation. And that's what we're really going to be focusing on um, for the remainder of this series. Now, when we're talking about these artificial neurons or these perceptrons, Oh, you know, one of the common mathematical ways we can describe them is by this simple sum uh, in a nonlinear activation function. So again, there's two terms here. It's a sum of weighted inputs, so some weights w and some inputs x, and then uh, some activation function. Now we can tie this back uh, somewhat, and like we said earlier, they're inspired by biological neurons. They may just not, uh, you know, not, they're not strictly trying to copy them. And so the, these can roughly correspond to um, the sum of correspond to uh, so the voltage accumulation that occurs right in a biological neuron. And the nonlinear activation function can be uh, correspond to this voltage gated membrane in a rough sense, right? So it's, you know, taking some inspiration, but um, it's clearly different than trying to, you know, faithfully represent these biological neurons. So, you know, these perceptrons, they can be easily thought of as these linear classifiers. For, so for a single perceptron, if you think about it as a linear classifier, you know, we can have something very simple, such as uh, taking our inputs to be these, um, these points here, and then we can use this nonlinear function to basically, you know, you know, give a score of say zero or one, or rather that it's, you know, greater than or less than a particular value here. And we can string multiple of these perceptrons together to do more complicated tasks. So on the right side, we've got an example of uh, five different perceptrons, four for making these dotted lines here, um, which basically say, you know, less than or greater than, and then a fifth to basically tie them all together. Um, so clearly, you know, as we have more perceptrons, right, we can do more complicated tasks. But, you know, one of the most common um, and most simple types of these, um, uh, these networks is this multi-layer perceptron, or MLP. So again, this is the most simple neural network and it's very intuitive, right? So if we just stack parallel neurons um, in a layer, right, we can put multiple of these layers together, right? In a layer, we're just going to be considering as a combination of the input weights, the activation function, and then our input. So there's two different ways we can kind of visualize this. So one of them is this graph representation on the, the left, where each of those um, individual circles represents um, a neuron, and then we've got our are weighted edges right as the lines but then on the right side we have a more you know functional way that we can think about this which is really just through uh, matrices and you know this might give you some intuition about why things like gpus um, or linear algebra is so important to you know areas like machine learning you can see that we can take our mlp and just decompose it into things like matrix vector multiplication and these linear algebra operations which is why you know you know there's such abundant parallelism here to exploit, um, which is why it's so important for, as, for us as computer architects to really understand kind of the foundations of this material. But we can also decompose this into you know, more mathematical uh, models. So for any of these layers i, we can just think about, it, think about it as the sum of weights times the inputs coming from the previous layer. So here we have for some layer um, n, right? We have our activation function, and then our weights of uh, you know Wn i um, j, and then our x of n minus one. So coming our inputs coming from the previous layer, right? But in the same you know vertical j, right? So this will be um, you know how we can describe mathematically a single layer here. Um, so and then of course we still have this nonlinear activation function here. And so what you may be wondering at this point is why do we need this nonlinear activation function? Why does it specifically have to be nonlinear? Right, so let's just kind of go back and think about the math here. So let's think about these inputs to each of our layers. So we'll consider them say x1 and x2. So x1 is just the weights ones from uh, the weights times the input um, x0. And we'll just consider um, 
our activation function should just be some linear function. Um, so the most simple case, maybe it's just, you know, just one, right? So we'll just multiply it by one so we can just kind of ignore it. And then we have our, uh, for our layer two, right? Which is just the weights two times the inputs coming from, um, coming from layer one. So if we go ahead and just substitute into x2 the result from x1, you see that we can really, these are all just linear transformations and we can always kind of reduce this down to a single layer, right? So this means that any of these neural networks could always be reduced down to just a single layer. But we, you know, we get to avoid this with something like a nonlinear activation function. And one of these, um, one of these very common ones is this ReLU um, or rectified linear unit activation function, which can be described like this. It's basically, you know, flat until it um, increases linear at some point, right? And this is often sufficient um, to do a number of complex things, right? So, you know, you know, after talking about this, let's talk more about these deep neural networks and, you know, why we've gone to deep neural networks. So a single perceptron is weak, right? And so as we talked about in the last video with kind of the history, a lot of the early pes uh, pessimism on this was, you know, basically saying that, you know, a single perceptron can't even figure out, you know, a simple logical function like a, a binary XOR, right? But even having a single hidden layer here, so if we go back to our, our model that we looked at, you know, we've got our input layer, an output layer, and then a single hidden layer in here. So with a network with a single hidden layer, um, we can actually do some pretty complex tasks. So, you know, basically what was proven uh, was that we could express a continuous function of arbitrary precision. precision. Now, um, this isn't, you know, say a free lunch here because uh, it doesn't give you any insight into, you know, well, how would you construct this network or how would you even train this network to, uh, you know, to solve this task? But it does say that it is possible. So it, you know, it famously kind of gets you out of the hole where you can't even, um, you know, figure out XOR with just a, even just a single hidden layer. So um, another thing about this is that, um, you know, we could have these giant, you know, just a single hidden layer that's massive, right? And so, um, but the problem is that these small complicated networks are actually cost prohibitive. So just having a single hidden layer, um, you know, it's not really feasible um, as a network design. But what we can do instead is just break it into smaller pieces like we typically do when we're trying to solve, you know, larger, more complex problems. So common optimization for, say, matrix multiplication is, say, cache tiling. So instead of solving, you know, the giant matrix multiplication all at once, you break it down into small subsets of problems that, say, fit resident or that are resident inside of your cache. Now, this has a number of benefits, including, including the ability to reuse the intermediate uh, solutions in the same network. But this doesn't mean that they're without problems as well, which is what we're going to be talking about in the next sec uh, section when we talk about learning, which is this thing called the vanishing gradient, right? So we'll get into that more in the second half of chapter two, which is all about learning. But that's going to go ahead and uh, do it for this video. Again, thanks for watching. As always, all this content can be found online, and it's in this book, Deep Learning for Computer Architects, from the Synthesis Lectures on Computer Architecture. If you're interested in any of my other content, check me out on this YouTube channel. And I also have my GitHub page, github.com slash coffeebeforearch, where I host all the code for all of my series. So that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. As always, I'm Nick, and hope you have a nice day.